Hi, my name is Megan Marley, and I am an assistant curator of archaeology at Ohio History Connection. Um, I became an archaeologist uh, because I really enjoyed studying the past, um, but I wanted to get a little more hands-on than a normal historian would, um, so I decided to do archaeology. Um, in order to become an archaeologist, what you have to do is you have to go to um, college for it. So as an undergrad, you study anthropology through archaeology, um, or you can do what I did. You can study history um, with a focus in a specific area. Uh, my area of uh, focus was actually Greek and Roman archaeology. Um, and then you can go to grad school and get a master's or a PhD uh, that will help you further move your career along. We're working at the Harding home, actually excavating test units where they plan to plant trees. And we're just making sure that when they dig holes for the trees, it won't disturb any important archeology span here, any part of the story of the Harding home that uh, would be lost if it were to be excavated without archeological excavation. So um, we're at the Harding home today because there is a project going on for the 2020 anniversary of Warren G. Harding's presidential election. Um, he ran his campaign from his front porch, um, which is why this house is so important, uh, besides the fact that a president also lived here. Um, so anytime at any of our sites we have site improvements going on and there's ground disturbance, we dig the dirt in uh, stratigraphic layers. We take the shovel, put them in the screen. These are quarter inch, eighth inch mesh, um, and we push the dirt through. Um, and then we always, when we find artifacts, we always uh, record exactly where they're from and how they were found. So uh, you always start with uh, Harding, the project name, so the Harding Home Restoration Project, um, where you're at, so this is test unit four, um, what stratigraphy level you found it in. Um, so this would be strat one, uh, at what depth. Uh, so we started at the centimeters uh, below surface, so we started at zero, so we started on the surface, and we haven't hit the bottom yet, um, and then the date, and then the excavators. So as we're going through this material, we pull out anything that looks like an artifact, a bone, something related to what people were doing here, but you'll see us often look at something and then toss it aside, we pitch it because we don't want to have to look at it again. So we're going through, looking for material, picking up things that look like they might be artifacts. If they are artifacts, we'll put them in the bag for this level. If they're not artifacts, we chuck them. So if you're doing archaeology on your own in your backyard or doing a new site improvement and you find an artifact, it's always important to document exactly where you found. There's actually some apps on your phone for the public that they can use where it will get your GPS location that you can later share with somebody if you, if you want to share your find with an archaeologist. So you'll see we're not just digging a hole as fast as we can, but we're digging it very systematically. We're digging it carefully, layer by layer. So right now I'm peeling off the surface layers to try to get down to some more significant layers but we do this because an archaeological site anywhere is like a book with the most recent pages at the top and as you read through the book you get deeper into, into the story and if you just dig a hole you'll end up mixing elements of those first pages with the last pages 
and it'll be all mixed up and you won't be able to tell the story. So the idea is to excavate the site a page at a time. So then you're reading that story or, or able later when you go through the notes and the analysis to read that story almost as it was written. Of course, we're reading it backwards because the end of the story is up here. The beginning of the story is, is a deeper. This allows us to read it a page at a time back in the lab. Today when we were digging one of these test units for these trees, we found um, part of the gravel that had been placed by Warren Harding and his campaign. Warren Harding ran his campaign from his front porch. It was called his front porch campaign. And in order for all of the visitors and the public and the press who were here to not get dirty in his yard, he put gravel all over uh, in the front yard right by his porch. And yesterday in one of our test units, we found some of that gravel. What we have here are some artifacts that we brought back from the Harding home. We have quite a number of objects here. Uh, they aren't particularly spectacular, but it's all part of what we do archaeology for. So we have a, an assortment of things. We have window glass and bottle glass, whiteware. To uh, people that don't uh, do archaeology or think that it's all finding marvelous objects as you see on television, these are rather inconsequential items. But to us, these are uh, clues of what took place in the past or part of a big puzzle or pages from a book so to speak that each one tells it has a little story to tell if you want to take time to listen to what it has to say. Cleaning is pretty basic. We use just clean tap water, a soft used up toothbrush and we just go along the edges <laughs> And, and get the uh, surface dirt off of it as much as we can. Now this is a piece of bone. I'm not sure exactly what bone it is, but you can tell that it's got this cut mark on it where, it's, where it was cleaved, perhaps by a butcher, indicating it was some cut of meat. Uh, contrary to what you see in movies and on some television shows, a lot of archaeology is going through stuff that people left behind. Uh, it's a record of their activities. Uh, you can look at all the fancy objects that you see in museums, that's one thing, but you want to see how people really lived back in whatever time that you happen to be investigating. And you look through the things that they discarded through everyday use. Somebody's got an expensive car in the driveway and you look in the trash can and you find a lot of tuna fish cans, you find out how they're paying for their expensive car. Very interesting is this small arrow point that I'll wash here. Uh, it's made out of the locally available Delaware chert and probably dates to somewhere around 13 to 1400 AD. And this shows that either somebody introduced this into the site at a later time or that this was actually a prehistoric site, a pre-contact site uh, back in the day. Okay, what we have here are some objects from another feature on the site and they contain quite a number of interesting objects. You have a, a lid here made out of earthenware that may have gone on a tobacco jar. Um, this is interesting because you've got a partial maker's mark on here so we can tell where this stuff came from. But what's really interesting is, and it gives a great insight on what people did back in the day, are these small bottles. Uh, these are um, patent medicine bottles. And this one, it's hard to see, but it says Paizo's Cure for Consumption, which is tuberculosis. And everybody knows that there's no cure for tuberculosis, especially in a in about a three or four ounce bottle. Uh, what this stuff was, was basically alcohol with some flavoring in it. it. May not have cured you, but you felt better about not maybe being as sick. And then you have other types of uh, material here. E.L. Palmer and Brothers, we know this. These are uh, bottles that were used for hair tonic. It's a, it's a very interesting way to find out how people lived in, back in the different times than what we have now. And so you wonder what people will think in the future, 100 years from now, when they dig up our Pepsi bottles that are made out of plastic and wondered what it is that we were doing back in those days when we were using such uh, bottles. After this has been cleaned, they're dried and sorted and everything takes place. That's sort of a preliminary step. 
The next step is to apply a number to it, give it a number for a catalog, and then you weigh and measure and describe what it is. You, we have a color system that we can describe the colors and then uh, put it into storage. And somebody wants to come along in 10, 15, 20 years and look at, see what we found in the yard, this stuff will still be here, maybe further explain what it is that we found.